Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to talk about glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. So what is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency? Well, it is pretty much what its name suggests. It is a deficiency in the enzyme glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. And in fact, it is the most common enzymatic deficiency of red blood cells. About 7.5% of the world population is deficient in this enzyme, but it varies between different groups of individuals. For instance, about 60 to 70 percent of Curtis Jews are deficient in glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. And in some parts of Africa, the prevalence is up to about 35 percent. And it is believed that deficiency in this enzyme may be protective against malaria. And this condition is inherited in an X-linked recessive fashion. Now, individuals with deficiency in glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase may experience hemolytic anemia, and babies that have a deficiency in this enzyme may experience neonatal hyperbilirubinemia or neonatal jaundice. Now what is the pathophysiology of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency? Well, because the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme is very important or critical in the pentose phosphate pathway, the pentose phosphate pathway is negatively affected when this enzyme is deficient. In fact, when we look at the schematic of the pentose phosphate pathway, we can see the reason why the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme is so important. It is the first step in the pentose phosphate pathway and it generates NADPH. So NADPH is generated from the dehydrogenase reaction of glucose 6-phosphate by the enzyme glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. That NADPH that is generated can then be utilized by glutathione reductase to reduce the amount of reactive oxygen species. So when this enzyme is deficient or absent, what happens is NADPH decreases and this reduces glutath glutathione reductase enzyme activity, which then would reduce its ability to clear reactive oxygen species or ROS, which would increase reactive oxygen species. So increased reactive oxygen species will then actually damage the red blood cell. So depending on the extent of which the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme is affected, you can get even more reactive oxygen species, more damage to red blood cells. But it depends on how much of the enzyme glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase is affected or what its activity is. And this leads to a classification of the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency condition. So this condition is classified depending on the severity by which the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme is affected. So some individuals are affected less, some individuals are affected more, and it depends on the activity of the enzyme or the, the amount of the enzyme that is functional. So class 1 glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency is the most severe, and this is when individuals have less than 10% of the normal amount of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme or less than 10% of the normal activity. And these individuals experience chronic hemolysis. In class 2, these individuals also have less than 10% of normal, but they only undergo intermittent hemolysis as opposed to chronic hemolysis in class 1. And these individuals are uh, typically have the allele, um, the Mediterranean allele of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. In class 3, class 3 has about 10 to 60 percent of normal activity. And again, these individuals also have intermittent hemolysis and they have the G6PDA allele. And class 4 is considered wild type. These are normal individuals. So normal individuals have the wild type allele, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase B, and these are considered normal. So Class 4 glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase are normal individuals. And there's also a class 5. And class 5 is interesting in that they actually have more or an increased activity of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. They have about two times the normal activity. And there doesn't seem to be any clinical issue with these individuals at all. So what are some of the blood findings of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency? Well, 
One of the most common when we look at a blood smear is anemia, but the anemia is normochromic and normocytic. So there is no change in or no excessive pallor, no excessive central pallor, and cells are typically normal. Now there are issues where there's anesocytosis, there's differing shapes of cells, and there's increased red cell distribution with some cells are smaller and some cells are bigger, so there's an increased range of size of cells. There's what we call poikilocytes. It just means that cells are different shapes. We get what we, um, in some cases we get what is called bite cells. Bite cells have almost a little chunk out of them. They almost look like they've been bitten into. That's why they're called bite cells. So we sometimes see these kind of cells in glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. And there's also something we call Heinz bodies. And Heinz bodies are these little accumulations of protein. Um, and there, it's actually little packages of hemoglobin in there. And these are what we call Heinz bodies. So we can see Heinz bodies as well in glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Now, if a patient does have glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, what do they present with, or what do they present like clinically? Well, majority of these individuals are asymptomatic. So they have no hemolysis and no anemia. Now, a lot of times, even though they may be majority asymptomatic in adulthood, they may have experienced neonatal hyperbilirubinemia or neonatal jaundice. So we mentioned this before. So at birth, there may be some stressors at the time of birth or around the first few days of life. This is when we can see a pronounced neonatal hyperbilirubinemia. And this um, can occur in um, more, severe, uh, more severe hyperbilirubinemia or more severe jaundice in patients with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Now, we mentioned that class 1 glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency undergoes chronic hemolysis. So we can see chronic hemolytic anemia in these patients, but it is very rare. So we do not typically think of chronic hemolysis in glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency patients. What typically occurs more commonly with individuals with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency is acute hemolytic anemia or periods of acute hemolysis. So patients can be asymptomatic for a majority of the time, but then they can have periods of acute hemolysis. So why do these periods of acute hemolysis occur? Well, it actually occurs due to some triggering factor. So we can think about if the pentosphosphate pathway is um, impaired in some way, if there's any stress on, or if there's an increased amount of stress on a red blood cell, we can see that it may not be able to compensate or may not be able to handle the stress in these patients. So we can see that the um, reactive oxygen species could increase and it could lead to um, impaired, damaged, or dis destroyed red blood cells. So acute hemolysis is caused by triggering factors. And some of these triggering factors can include medications. Medications like Dapsone, Dapsone is for leprosy, nitrofurantoin, Primaquin. Primaquin is actually an anti-malarial medication. Methylene blue is also another chemical or drug that can lead to a period of acute hemolysis. Dimercaparol can also trigger acute hemolysis in these patients. Other chemicals and even foods can trigger acute hemolysis in patients with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. The chemical naphthalene, which is found in mothballs, can trigger acute hemolysis in these patients. Henna dyes can even trigger acute hemolysis. And even eating fava beans and other legumes can trigger acute hemolysis in these patients. Uh, there's maybe some data to support that even drinking red wine can actually trigger acute hemolysis in these patients. So there are many different things that can trigger acute hemolysis in patients with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. There's many more that I have not listed, but some of these are the major ones that you may come across. So how do we diagnose and treat a patient that has glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency? Well, to begin, we can do some screening tests on these patients. There's something called a fluorescent spot test. The fluorescent spot test is the most reliable and sensitive screening test. 
and it just simply detects the fluorescence of NADPH. So if um, depending on the level of activity of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, we'll see that maybe there's less NADPH or there's more NADPH. So this can detect the fluorescence of NADPH. Another screening test is met hemoglobin reduction test. So these are a couple of the screening tests that can be used. So if we've had a positive screening test, some of the confirmatory tests can include simple assays to, to assess the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme activity. So again, this is looking at the ability of the patient's uh, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme to actually generate NADPH. So what they can do in these um, assays is that they can use some of the patient's red blood cell hemolysate. They can add it to um, some glucose 6-phosphate and see how much of their glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme can convert that glucose 6-phosphate to NADPH. That's a way to detect the enzymatic activity of a patient's glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase enzyme. So when we've diagnosed someone with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, how do we treat them? Well, some of it is management simply by avoiding and removing some of these triggers that we've talked about before. Avoiding some of those unsafe medications that I listed previously like Dapsone and Nitrofurantoin. Some of the dietary restrictions, avoiding fava beans and other legumes can help to avoid some of these periods of hemolysis. Folic acid supplementation can help as well. So this is typically helpful in patients with chronic hemolysis. Um, and about one milligram per day is a um, good starting point for folic acid supplementation. And in severe cases, um, perhaps with chronic hemolysis, blood transfusions may be indicated as well. Anyways, guys, that was a lesson on glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more videos like this one. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.